Hey there, welcome back to the Friendly Ties podcast. Uh, today we are talking about Golem, which is a new heavy-ish weight Euro game, and uh, it's a, a very new release. In fact, we don't have a copy of it. We've played it a bunch on Tabletop Simulator, though. Uh, speaking of that, we actually filmed a full playthrough of this with myself, Anastasia, and Nick, and you can find that on the John Gets Games YouTube channel. There's also a link to it in the description of this podcast. Um, we're going to spoil that play a whole bunch, so if you don't want those spoilers, then watch the playthrough first, and if not, then um, we anticipate this being uh, being able to explain the game well enough so that you'll know what's happening even without that. Uh, now, actually, on that note, um, I'm just going to do a really brief overview of what this game is like. Um, in this game, you take exactly 12 turns, and on most of your turns, you're going to be taking a marble from a row. You kind of randomly pour marbles out, and then you get to do actions based off of where that marble is taken from, and you'll get resources depending on how many marbles there are. Uh, now, the central mechanic of this game really is there are these streets in the middle of the board with these golem figures that we are all creating that are our own and they kind of walk down the streets and the farther they go the more powerful actions they get close to but the farther they go the harder they are to control which could end up really costing you a bunch of victory points and you have to plan ahead to make sure that you can actually keep them under control so it's kind of an engine building game that can sometimes punch you back in the face or at least make you worried about getting punched back in the face um, now at this point I've played this game five times. Anastasia has played it five times, and Nick has played it four times. And I think we have a bunch of things that we want to say about it in general. So let's start talking about it. Let's let's get the most important thing out there first, which is, uh, you know, if you just watched the playthrough, you saw that I I won that game, uh, which you know, as of is, course is he makes that like the most theme. important thing. No, 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 no. <laughs> the most important part is to be very clear that in the first game we played, Anastasia cleaned our clocks. That and is true. She's going to bring it up later if she doesn't bring it up now. So I'm going to make sure it gets brought up first. <laughs> Actually, the, the, speaking of just scores in general, um, this last play, the one that we filmed for the playthrough, was was kind of strange in how different it was from the last time we played. The three of us played this like three nights ago, um, kind of on a whim. <laughs> and in the game we played before, we all did amazing. We just did everything we wanted to. All of us felt like we played just about a perfect game. The The scores were ludicrously tight. Anastasia and Nick tied at 189. I had 183. I was right behind. And then tonight, Nick won with 145. I had my lowest score ever of like 126, and Anastasia was a few points above that. And it's just really interesting to show that sometimes this game can really pop off like crazy, and you could do seemingly everything, and then <laughs> you might feel like you've cracked the game, and then, you know, three days later, just faceplant. The fifth play, I had my worst score. I, I think that's kind of interesting. Yeah, for sure. No, I I definitely think that this this is one of those games and 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 this is this is apropos of these designers, right? Like like their previous designs if you've ever played Lorenzo or Grand Austria Hotel, this obviously shares a ton of mechanics with Grand Austria Hotel, uh which is actually one of my favorite games, which is I think why I did do so well in our first play of it because the mechanic, the marbles mechanic is very similar to that game. And I understood that really well, and and I like it. But uh, you know, they obviously they also did I think Darwin's Journey. They've done a they've done Coimbra, so many games. Um, but like a lot of those games, you either have an amazing play and everything works out for you, or like nothing's working out for you. And sure, you can kind of come out somewhere in the middle. But this is definitely one of those games where if everything's kind of working it's going to feel fantastic and there's but there's definitely going to be plays of this and Nick and I played a two player game yesterday actually where I you know from the first turn from the from the moment we drafted our cards I was like oh I'm out of this like I <laughs> like I just did it and in fact I was really pleased to see that in this game if you do watch the playthrough Nick sort of felt that way at the beginning of this game, and he actually still came out on top and won. So it's it's not a hundred percent. I mean, you know, you 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 gotta not let that mindset get to you. But I do think you can get yourself in a place where you just know those things aren't going to happen, or even halfway through the game, you're like, "How is it that I had, you know, had my whole board flipped over last last game by the time I got here?" Because you, you did know, everything. Whole, yeah, yeah. You've got twelve turns in this whole game. That's it. So you know, what are you going to do with it? I'm trying to put my finger on this game. What about it makes... Because I in the games that I've won and in the games that I've lost, I've always felt this sort of like despondence and then like at the end <laughs> when like i when i like win there's like a relief or in this past game there's a confusion 
And I generally <laughs> in games have a pretty good sense of like where I'm at and like where the board is at. And there's something about this game that makes me just feel like things are not going well. And like when they are going well, I'm just like, oh, thank God I didn't screw up. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I feel like in this last game, I mean, obviously Nick won, Nick played the best, but I feel like for me personally, I feel like I I was my own worst enemy. I think I must have been to get, you know, the worst score that I've ever had when I've actually pieced together much better game plans than this and significantly better scores than 145. But also, I guess another thing to consider is there is a decent amount of setup variability in this game. Uh, I mentioned there are these streets that the golems wander down with actions and there's 10 action tiles total and you randomly choose seven of them. So you're going to see the same ones game after game, but three of them are removed uh, from each of those. And there's scoring cards that are different. Um, there's actual book cards that you can shove into your tableau. There's your objectives. There's a whole ton of things that are different from one game to the next that I guess is going to potentially increase or decrease the score ceiling. And so maybe this was just a low score ceiling game, or maybe we were just all <laughs> kind of bubbling around a bit. You know, that's actually something that I want to, that's actually my first critique of the game. You know, John, you say there's a ton of variability in this game and, and there is, but the, the three golem tracks, uh, while there's different tiles that come on, I believe there's what, 10 and you pick, I actually don't quote me on the number, but you pick a bunch of them out, but the order in which you place them out is is predetermined so that you know the better right. ones are always later and um and so on um but what i have found in the five plays of this so far that i have is that order has has actually led me to feeling a little bit of sameness in terms of the way that i've approached the game so even though there's all these different things that can be different those those three kind of golem tracks being the same means that there can almost always be sort of an I have felt there's like an ideal place to place things where I'm like okay in the in the yellow track I think every single game I played the first spot and the second spot has been two gold and the second spot has been a minus two upgrade and so like I have always seen myself as being like okay that is the best spot to place your new golems because they go over and they immediately upgrade I don't know I just that is my one critique is I almost wish that you could vary all the tiles up and then really have drastically different games. And and look, we're talking to that, right? There's a lot of differences going on here, but I, I have felt just a little bit of sameness in that and wanting like wanting to have even more options and, and a little bit more kind of potential for craziness come out in the board that's having some of those higher powered things maybe be lower and just having the ability to kind of pop off a little bit with that the math of the game is is very visible right like most of the most of the rewards are worth a value of three and then each of the three resources are worth a value of one per resource and so you know as you kind of like look down the track and those those golem rewards range from like two to five ish um but they are kind of like in that stacked order, like you're saying, Anastasia. And yeah, I, I agree with you that like the way that those are laid out, you have a very good sense. And we tend to fall into rhythms where the a lot of the players are like kind of standing on the same spaces or sort of like following the same loops um, because, you know, oh, like in this game, for instance, the red track, the second space was like advance a person, which was like one, which was the nicest second space, I think of, of any of the three rows. Um, and John and I use that like a ton. Yeah. Right. We need to just take a moment and talk about the level of AP that goes into <laughs> Analysis this game. paralysis is bonkers <laughs> in this game. You know, we talked about this, obviously, if you've been listening to the podcast or you've been watching the playthroughs, you know, we just played Ark Nova. So we've talked a lot about games with long play times and lots of thinking, although our experience as far as that Ark Nova is actually lessened in time. And this game has stayed about the same because, yeah. you know, I think I said this, um, if it makes it in a playthrough, like a game that makes Nick AP is, is a game that, you know, has a lot of AP. Yeah. He's generally not that type of player. And this whatever you, if you watch the playthrough it's going to be so much shorter than the amount of time that we sat sitting there thinking crunching all turns thinking 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 and that has not changed even with five plays it is there is so much to think about here and 
I just want to put this out there that I think that actually kind of affects the dynamics of the table a little bit. Like, I don't think this is a game where you're going to sit down and you're going to joke a lot or going to like talk a lot because you are really sitting there focused on how do you make that math work? How do you make those things work? And I, I could even feel that when we were playing. It's like, this is a game where that tension, that feeling like, like Nick said, like, am I, am I going to make a mistake that is yeah. going to, you know, cost me the game? is very tense and and so i actually i don't this is not this it, it can be very satisfying but it's a uh, it's a little bit stressful yeah for sure i mean at a high level it's easy to say oh it's a 12 turn game but there's kind of deceptively a bunch of stealth turns th- and everything that you do in this game every every single decision that you make feels so important and it feels like you have to really think far down the line because you do take these 12 main actions but then every single round uh, every of the four rounds you're going to move your golems a certain amount of spaces and you can split that up and that is an incredible puzzle usually often anyway to think about where to put the golems because where they are is going to dictate action spaces that you could potentially activate later on and the order in which you can activate them is important and do you have enough resources to pull all of that off so those are decisions that you're making and you're doing that in order and then also um, at the end of each round there's income and then you get an upgrade and sometimes the upgrade is an obvious decision you just flip a thing over and you're done and other times the upgrade, you flip it over, and that actually lets you do another thing, which might bump into another thing. And you can have moments of cascading actions in this game. And, and I say moments, but realistically, frequently, there are cascading actions. And because of that possibility, you have to devote a lot of mental brain power to thinking about that cascade. And also, just as you're you know, falling down this uh, uh, metaphorical cascade of actions, you can, you can twist and turn and go kind of to the right and kind of to the left. And how is that going to affect this? And how is that going to affect that? And, and like Anastasia said, with repeated plays, this one is not really getting shorter. Uh, like maybe in a very small way, like maybe 5 to 10% shorter, whereas Arc Nova to compare another heavy game we've played a bunch recently, it, we were twice as fast at that game as we were when we first started. And I think it's because there's just so much to potentially think about. And there kept being surprise decisions too, because I found myself so focused on, you know, what action am I going to take? What are the ramifications of that action? And then suddenly, you know, it's like, oh, it's time to move your golems. And you're like, oh my gosh, I have, I was focusing on everything else. I wasn't even thinking about moving golems. Okay, hold on a second. Now I need to think about moving golems. And, you know, that, can turn into a lot of time and all of this stuff also you know it requires one of the like common things that someone says like oh if you're thinking a lot during the game someone's taking a long time during their turn then like you could be thinking about your turn but the reality is that there's so many little moves and like uh so much little bookkeeping uh i don't know if i should throw out the dreaded fiddly word in this game but <laughs> there's 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 constant errors and we yeah new coming into this game we're like let's play a couple times before we record our playthrough and even still we screwed up so many times in this like, playthrough <laughs> where we're like yeah. trying to be very intentional about it you were like you you need someone else at the table to be monitoring what you're doing otherwise you're going to forget something but that other yeah. person is probably thinking about their turn right. <laughs> Not right. Yeah, right. Here. yeah. <laughs> no we actually made that choice to go through each of our scoring. I mean, I said this multiple times in our in our earlier plays of this. I was like, when we film this, we are going to need to do each of our incomes individually, not at the same time, because I guarantee you, doing it simultaneously, I am forgetting something. I am not, <laughs> I'm not keeping track of this, and that's the best way for us to keep track of what's going on. No, you're, you're totally right. And I actually want to go back to something, John, that you just said, and actually, Nick, you touched on this as well, which is that the way things change, like, you know, you're thinking on, you know, I'm thinking on John's turn and I, I should be ready on my turn. But this is actually, now we've only played it once two player and I have a feeling that two player is going to be my favorite way to play this game. That's my favorite way to play Grand Austria Hotel, which I, I am going to go out on a limb and uh, say is sort of the lighter version of this. This is definitely takes Grand Austria Hotel and, you know, cranks it up a notch, which at first I thought was going to replace it for me. But I actually have found myself kind of wanting to go back to the, 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 the mental simplicity of building out my hotel room. But, but we'll see. We're going to have to play that one and, um, and do a real comparison. But I feel that playing it with three, the number of things that can change makes it really hard to kind of predict. You can sort of predict what you're doing, but so many things change. But actually in this play, a lot of things changed, at least for me, for the better. So what I actually found is I was like, okay... This is going to be my path. Oh, wait, 
John took a card and that just made this card cheaper. So now suddenly I have more options than I had before. I actually had less choices before they took their actions, which is sort of the opposite sometimes, you know, where you're often like, okay, well, I'm, you know, by the time everyone takes their marbles, you know, what is going to be left for me? But there, there is a a fair number of opportunities for things to, to affect that in multiple directions. So it's something to consider that there's just so much to think about. So we've been talking about action chains a lot. And I think, with kind of a, I don't know, negative connotation, certainly the analysis paralysis and whatnot. But I do want to shine an opposite light on these action cascades and say that I think it'd be so much fun. <laughs> it's the, really the, the short version. Like For when sure. this game, when you have a plan and the plan works out, you could do an astonishing number of things. I, th- I vaguely remember in my, I think, second play of this, I counted out the number of discrete things I did after you know taking a single action before it was the next person's turn. And it was like 15 different things because I did this thing, which bumped into that thing. And let me do this and let me unlock this to give me income for that. And then I was just bouncing all over the place. And and that could be really fun, like I said. And also just seeing that through line. Like there have been many times in, in previous plays of this where it'll be my turn. And before I do anything, I say, hold on, everybody, this is going to be amazing. <laughs> like, like everybody look at me. <laughs> There's almost a, a showman aspect to this game. Sometimes when you know you're going to have a turn that's amazing, you're kind of in disbelief that your turn's going to be this amazing and you want people to watch it to A, maybe catch your, your mistake or B, just like marvel at it, <laughs> at this thing that you were able to put together. Like, look at this amazing Rube Goldberg uh, series of stuff and that could be a lot of fun. Like that, that's definitely the highlight of this game is those moments. And I've had many of them across the five plays. Although I feel like I didn't really have any of those in the game that we played uh, for the playthrough, which is a little unfortunate. That was definitely not the most pop-off and combo-y version of this game that I've seen. Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, it has a lot of the opportunity to do really fun things. When I came into this game, like what I was sort of expecting is... uh this this concept of the like runaway engine right that you're like golems are moving ahead of you they're like giving you resources or um, benefits and you have to like at a certain point decide to call them because they're getting out of hand they're costing you whatever victory points or whatever and that was what i was um, most looking forward to in the game and on my first place i was actually a little bit disappointed because it didn't feel like an engine in the way that i had in my mind but then upon sort of revisiting it and like reimagining what is going on with the golems i realized that okay like it's a thing that you are required to manage in the game it gives you a lot of bonuses like how you're activating your golems what streets they're moving on and allows you to sort of shape your your game plan um and moving them and and saying this is where i'm gonna head and this is these your golems are the one thing that you can guarantee when you move them somewhere that that's an action that you can take. Whereas in other instances, like the card might not be out there. Another player might steal it from you or there's not enough marbles to execute what you want to do. But in, in the case of like taking the work action, like executing your golems, that's like one thing that you absolutely can control in the game. And then I realized that it's not about the engine being runaway so much as like you have to have a plan for how you're going to mitigate golems so if your name's anastasia it is how do i murder all my golems yes Um, (laughs) if it's me then it's probably how do i get all my students into a position that my golems aren't going to punish me and that's not just in this game that's like a that's like a through thread and like how we play this game and john's john's a switch hitter he'll he'll do what seems what's appropriate for the situation (laughs) I just want to point out that while I murdered a lot of golems, I did have several <laughs> still alive. Well, the first time we played, Anastasia killed essentially all of them. Like, I, I don't think a single round started where you had to move golems after the first one, and you stopped us. You had a, a massive score. It almost made me worried, like, is it is it better to kill your golems than use them? But then in subsequent plays, we've we've seen even better scores with, you know, masterful use of the golems at times for, between players. Yeah, the, that first play that we played in this game, it's a, it's a pretty hefty teach. And, and there's a lot of iconography. There's a lot of stuff going on, right? So I, like I said, I was sort of familiar with the marble mechanics. So I was like, okay. like and, and, and the board, I was like, look, the best way for me to play this game is to just focus on end game points and just try to, I love, you know, to, you know, to answer the question of like, what is, what is the thing I like 
most about this game, I think for me, I love the engine you can create on your personal board. I love that, that the gold side, you know, that you can flip over these things that can constantly give you income. And when you activate them, you give you income, you get income on your rounds when you, if you put the appropriate, you know, books or marble color. And if you do that, it also activates them. I think that's really fun. I love the way you take cards and when you place the cards if you put them in the right row you can double them or you put them in another row you can get more benefits and to be honest with you guys like I, I told you guys this like the the first play I didn't really understand the golem mechanic at all I didn't realize you got punished for your golems at the end of your turn and then moved them at the start of the next turn I didn't understand that I thought you moved them and then got punished and I was just so scared of getting the situation where because the the loss is pretty significant and you lose a lot of points. In fact, I've never seen that happen that you we've lost points for it. But I thought I was, you know, gonna get myself in a situation where they were gonna be too far out. I'm just gonna lose tons and tons of points. And it it scared me. So I played that whole game without doing golems at all. I just yeah. I just killed I killed all of them. And it helped we had bonuses that worked with that and everything anyway. So I just I got rid of every single one as quickly as I could put it out on the board. And that was fantastic. In fact, I, I went kind of, you know, I, you know me, I went in with that goal. I was like, can I play this without doing golems? And John was like, I don't think you can. And I was like, mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you, you stopped us. It was a very solid win. But since then, I have really come to appreciate the, the different ways. Nick, you, you put it perfectly. That you can, that is the one thing you can control. And I really felt that in this play. I was like, oh, great. Yes, as long as I go here, I can guarantee that I have the ability to do this action. But I'm curious, guys, because I don't feel like, though, I have yet to really master the use of my golems. I, this was a complaint I've had in a little bit in this game, but the taking the action to activate my golems is actually sometimes not as beneficial as doing one of the other actions because you get you get so much. You get resources, you get an upgrade, you can take a card, you can do, you can do a lot of things. And John, this actually happened in this play, right? You chose to take a card instead of activating your golems. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, I'm curious what you guys think about, that's why I was sort of talking about the, the different spaces. There's a lot to think about where you move them, which spaces you can control and, and how many. I, I feel like I'm getting better at that and it is opening more opportunities, but I'm still not totally convinced that that golem track is the best way to approach a game. I can I can jump on that answer because the thing I was excited about, like I said, in this game is the golem stuff. Like I don't care about stacking the books. I don't really care about building the like cauldrons. Um, I want to I want to play the golem game. To me, that's the thing that stands out as unique. And in that first game that we played, right, I was I was struggling a lot. You and were like very to, confused the whole I was you knew the rules, yeah. you just didn't know what to do. Yeah. I could not grok what was going on. And in that first game that we played, you know, we played it in two pieces. We played the game and then I left to go somewhere and then we played at another like the next day, I think we the finished. The next day, it. yeah. And in the car ride where this place that I was going to afterwards, I like smacked myself in the head and I was like, Oh, that's how golems work. Like when I have like two in play and I'm managing them well, they just run rampant because the amount of moves that I have, I can't disseminate across them. So I've since played golems in some in some regard every game. I think every game I've played, I've put out four golems. And in this past game, I was like, I really want to try to get just piles of golems and play and i ended the game with five which i was so excited about <laughs> uh, and and obviously the anti anastasia strategy yeah yeah and so so i realized that like with golems you have to think about like where are your students at is like the first part of it and then two is like how um how are you going to like be using them or can they like move backwards or you know using any of those like special powers or just like you need to think about how you're paying attention to them. But the benefit that that gave me in this game is I was never forced to take kill actions, which in the third round of this game, Anastasia, you had to, you had to kill two of them. And like you made your game plan around doing that, which tied your hands in terms of like what else you were able to do. And so I think the golems are viable, but it requires you to set up and, and organize for it and like have a plan around it. And that was something that I think when you start playing with golems, 
it's the most counterintuitive like aspect of this game because it's the newest right you know what nick you make a great point there because i I just realized that in this play was the first time i had actually kept (laughs) enough golems alive that i had at one point i think i even had four on the board and and i was able to actually control their movement for the first time i was able to think oh i want to go to this spot and i want to go here and i want to move this one here and i did feel like because i had so many and i could break that movement across multiple of them I could really control the spots that they went to. It still made for some tough choices, but I did feel like I could do something with that. So that that's actually a great point. I didn't I didn't I didn't think about that. One thing we haven't really talked about at all yet is randomness in this heavy game where you're only taking 12 turns. Um you know, it, the the main mechanic is you drop a bunch of colored marbles down into a bunch of trays and then you know, the number of marbles in a row is going to essentially incentivize you to go there because you'll get a big discount or a bunch of stuff. But there's also, you know, some card draw luck. There's a, a river of cards in the middle of the table. And frequently in many of the games, like the the newest card gets purchased, even though it's expensive. There's a, the newer a card is, the more expensive it is to actually do. Um, and then there's also, you know, times where you could draw random objectives from the top of the deck to try and get points for those. There's actually a surprising number of spots in this game where randomness can peek in oh and also the rabbi actions we haven't talked about those at all so far um i mentioned you take 12 turns on eight of those turns you take a marble action but on the other four turns so once per round you do a rabbi action which means you put your rabbi token down onto a random tile you see what it is but at the start of each round you randomly bring out these tiles with a wide variety of actions on them and those are not ordered with strength in mind and the order in which you put your rabbi down is turn order so that's very important and sometimes the strongest rabbi tile might be at the top or maybe the strongest will be at the bottom or you know maybe they're all pretty evenly balanced but one is just better for you in this certain moment and i'm just curious what you two think about the role of randomness in this game i actually quite like euros with a dash of luck i like the sort of excitement that that brings in um I'm a, a big fan of a lot of Steppenfeld's games. I like, you know, what dice brings to Castles of Burgundy. I like those elements. So for me, and, you know, to go back to Grand Austria Hotel, which uses the same mechanic, which is probably, it's hard for me. Like, I love the action selection mechanic in Concordia so much. That's probably my favorite game mechanic. And this is a very, very close second. I mean, the first time I played Grand Austria Hotel, which uses exactly the same, you know, you roll dice in that case, but this idea that whatever you roll goes onto these, the make increases the strength of each of these spaces, just like this with the marbles. I just, I thought it was the most brilliant game mechanic I had ever come across. I just, I couldn't stop talking about it. So for me to see that here again is really exciting. And I like, I love that moment when you put the marbles into the dice, marble tower, dice tower, marble tower, <laughs> randomizer tower, random i didn't call it a marble tower when you put them in there and then they come out and you're just like waiting you know it's like yeah. breath like it's so exciting to see hey did i get you know is is, is this one action going to be massively powered and, and is that going to direct me so like for as much randomness as there is i feel like that actually i find that randomness as a direction i'm like okay great well there's a lot of marbles here that's going to kind of dictate this and you have to decide am i going to choose this or am I going to choose what I had planned for? And you have to kind of adapt to that. And, you know, you guys have seen me multiple times be like, I'm going to pass just to see what the marble gods are going to give me next round. And, and is yeah. that going to work out in my favor? And several times the play we had the other day where Nick and I tied, John took a card and the card that came out next was exactly the card I needed to like complete one of my objectives and score a <laughs> boat like oh, we wouldn't have tied if it if that card didn't come out so right um you know but that's all with it working in my favor right yeah so the randomness in this game is uh interesting you know it's a it's a heavy not heavy or medium heavy whatever you want to call it like it's a heavier euro where you really need to attend to the resources um but i agree with anastasia like i like the fact that like the you know, marbles roll out and you're like, ooh, I really wanted to like buy books this turn, but I either can't or it's just so juicy to go build a like discount golem right now 
that maybe I should go do that instead. And I think there's a lot of games that have like three avenues, right? Like Great Western Trail is like one of my favorite games that has like three avenues. You're, you know, going cowboys or builders or um, engineers. And in that game, you generally like pick a strategy and maybe stick to a second one. But in this game, you are picking almost certainly two strategies and like probably dabbling in the third. And so that required flexibility, I think like it makes you pay attention to the game state and it is in some cases an output randomness when you're like doing a pass action you're like i need this thing to happen and like it doesn't work out which which can feel a little bit sucky but it's mostly an input randomness that is interesting uh and you know the other thing that john mentioned is the the rabbis and the rabbi actions and like the strength of those actions you know are not equal and they're not equal for your current game state and the current situation but I actually really like how those actions dictate turn order because they're all kind of similarly, the strengths of those strengths of those rabbi actions, um, again, depending on your game state. And so, you know, you can say to yourself, like, I'll take this slightly weaker action. And John did that in this game, right? Like you took yeah. the the um, on the first turn, kill the golem and get one brick and a point instead of getting two resources of my choice because I want to go first next turn. Yeah. And I like that. Like I like, cause turn order really matters in this game. You have control over it, but it's not like you have to sacrifice an entire action to go first. It's not like it's just like randomly passing around the table. Like the fact that there's some player control to that is cool. So I yeah. do, I do think that the, the randomness in this game can feel bad. Don't get me wrong. But I think largely it is a benefit, it's a boon to, to what's going on. One thing you talked about with the, the avenues to doing stuff with your strategy kind of leads me to a point that I've heard both of you say in other games, and I do want to chat about it. And that's the idea of doing everything. We mentioned at the beginning of this episode that the last time we played, not the one we recorded, but the one before that, we had astronomical scores compared to this play. And it kind of seemed like we all played a perfect game the last time where we felt like we got close to that. And I remember both of you were a little worried that you felt like maybe you did too much. Like maybe you had the opportunity, despite only having 12 turns, to kind of do everything that you wanted to do. And there wasn't that much mystery left there, at least in that specific play. Obviously, in the one that we recorded today, there was a lot I think we all would have liked to do before the game was over. Yeah, I mean, in that other game, Anastasia had flipped every single upgrade except for one, like, piddly one you know like yeah. one not that important one yeah and i think that's a problem i think that in a and 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 also like in that game her last action was some like get a couple points and there was another game that we played with you john where your last action was like well i'm gonna get like a couple things yeah um or like even your rabbi action in this game that we just watched where you're like all right yolo and just like drew some cards off the top of the deck and they did <laughs> yeah my last anything. action was am i gonna get zero f- points four points or maybe eight points oh i got zero <laughs> yeah and that's that's really i think disappointing in a 12 action game where your score is going to be you know 150 give or take 30 points um you don't want that 12th action or that 11th action to like feel like a total dud. And um, the fact that there's like a a ceiling on this game means that when you play it, you're going to be doing some of the same, you know, the the same things and like kind of like going in the same paths and find yourselves in these same trenches. Um, And I don't, I don't think that's good for replayability. I am, I am still concerned about that. Yeah. So am I, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, I already kind of touched on this a little bit earlier with what I was saying about, you know, randomizing, adding even more variability than there already is by randomizing more of the the column track um, spaces. But yeah, for me, it's really interesting to compare this play to the last one, considering I did, I did, I told them, I was like, you know, I did literally everything I wanted to do. Like my last action was just like, oh, I think I flipped everything. So like, I'm good. Like there was like, (laughs) And and to basically set out with the same goal here, and I, I did multiple things within this play where I found ways to maximize, you know, take two upgrade actions at once or, you know, create a golem and get an upgrade. And, and I kind of went out of my way to make sure I was trying to get every possible upgrade option that I had. And this actually kind of circles me back to what I was saying about kind of how do you best utilize your golems and still flip so much of your board because the more you take the activate the golems action, the less upgrades you get because every single time you take the yellow, red, or blue actions, you 
get to do an upgrade if you use it efficiently. And so, you know, for my brain, a lot of what I love about playing a Euro is kind of trying to like perfect my strategy, which is what I, you know, with a lot of games, you hope is just a lost cause, right? Like you're going to keep playing it no matter what. And every time you're going to kind of see how that goes. And what I do feel with this game is that I kind of feel like I could create a perfect strategy, even though of course I can't because of the variability of the game. But that also just means that there are some games where you're just inherently not going to be able to do as well because the game state has made it so you can't possibly get all the gold bars. You can't possibly do different things. And I can't decide if I find that more of a challenge or if I find that sort of frustrating that I I feel like I can constantly feel like I'm going to be repeating certain things, trying to create this perfect machine and succeeding or failing, but almost finding myself just repeating the same things to try and kind of create that same like, oh, look, yes, I accomplished, I managed to accomplish everything this game. And I don't know if that's, I, I, I do worry because it already sort of happened that that is, that is losing a little bit of its luster as we keep going. Yeah, I mean, we've played it a lot in quick succession as well. Uh, I've been thinking about that a decent amount because I remember after I played the game the first time, I liked it quite a bit. And I, I think I told you too that you'd probably like it. Um, after I played it the second time, I was thinking that was the best game I'd played all year. <laughs> I was so incredibly high on it. And we were very into Arc Nova at that point. We were playing that one a bunch. And I was just like, I think I like Golem better. Like the, the highs in this game are just so up there. This game is so amazing the way you can pop off and plan. But I have to admit, after playing it now five times, the, the shine is starting to wear a, a little bit. Uh, my, my excitement for it has, has gone down a decent amount. And like if someone asked me, you know, hey, do you want to spend two hours playing Golem right now or Arc Nova? I'd probably play Arc Nova instead just because I feel like, okay, I've played Golem like three times in the last <laughs> nine or ten days, but I've also played Arc Nova almost the same amount of t- uh, times in the same amount of uh, days. And I know we're harping on that game a lot, or at least I am, because it's fresh in our minds because we're playing it a lot. But I'm just looking at the raw excitement of this. I am looking forward to playing this one more. I will say we, I played it at four players once, and that was a longer experience than I think I'd like. I think I agree with what Anastasia said earlier, that two-player would be my preferred count, even though I haven't played it at two. And I do look forward to to playing with this one more, but I do feel like, I wonder how many more aha or oh my goodness moments I'm going to see. Like, oh, I didn't realize the game could do this or I didn't know it could do that. I feel like I've seen those that the game is going to give me. And I think in future plays, I'm much more likely to just have, you know, revisions and refinements and slightly different versions of things I've seen versus other games. And, you know, that's not necessarily a slight against the game. That's just kind of where I'm at with it right now. It feels like the first few plays, you're, there's right one of two things. You're like either confused with what's going on in the math, which was my experience, or you're like doing crazy combos, which is what happened with Anastasia and John. And like that's that's cool and exciting. But no matter what of those two experiences that you have, you're sort of like, how is the math in this game working? And you like do that, and then you're like, oh, I see how the math in this game is working. Like I see how these pieces connect with those pieces and how I have to like attend to my golems or how I have to like balance these three strategies and how I'm going to score points at the end of the game. Uh, And like, we even had a realization at the end of one of the games, right? It's basically like you're going to score something like half your points at the end of the game and half your points during the game. You know, that ratio will change a little bit based on what you've done, but you, you have that understanding, right? And that, that kind of like pattern, you know, flows through in the in the few times that we've played. So, so you know what you're in for, and then once you sort of like had that learning, there's not a lot of space to explore. There's not a lot of like I'm going to try this strategy, this game, because as yeah. Anastasia was saying, like you are probably doing everything. You're probably like attending to this, attending to this, and attending to that, and like those those are the three things that you're doing. Honestly, I feel like that's probably part of the why I did so poorly in this play. I went harder on getting cards in this play than I have before. And I took several actions where I bought a card and then did not do an upgrade because I was done. I had upgraded everything. And so that was kind of a waste. Like maybe I should have gone for a different action, maybe done a, you know, get some coins and do some more coin upgrades to vary things around. I think I left a lot of actions kind of wasted on the floor because I was hyper-focused on trying to make a big card game work. And, and that was probably a mistake if I had been a little bit more general and done everything else a little bit more, I bet my score would have been significantly better. 
Yeah, and I think for as much as I was sort of joking that I wasn't moving my students in this game, I think that that, you know, the students are a big piece of income, and I personally think that hurt me as, you know, that was sort of my weak spot, is I was so hyper-focused on doing upgrades on my board that I wasn't really considering how much moving my students, or or that I was so hyper-focusing on getting my engine to work. You know, I was always trying to take blue marbles, which didn't always sync up with the cards, or I was trying to make the cards work. And, and that's another piece of this game that we haven't really talked about, which I just want to touch on, which is that there's this added element of these four customer cards that, that changes yeah. which marble you take. So here you've got the marbles come out, they amplify the different actions, great. But then which one you choose... Well, if you have upgraded your machine in a certain way, you might get an added benefit. I got three gold every time I took a blue marble. So I was definitely incentivized to do that, but so was John. And then in addition to that, taking specific colors affects your ability to then have this, this you know, be able to serve this customer at the end of the round, which gives you another great bonus. And Nick had made a great point after our last play that he felt that taking those customer actions was kind of key to to making everything pop off. And I heard that. And I think I did three of them. I think we all did three out of four of them. And they were good and they do. And you can kind of build your strategy around that. But it does make for even more difficult decisions as you're trying to choose which color marble you take. And I think that there is a place in this game where there are just so many decisions that trying to choose that amongst everything else i personally feel like in this play i I was just i don't want to say trying to do too much because you are trying to do everything but the timing of which you do that and how you make that work for you is key to whether or not you're going to have those big turns or or not so i i like the citizens and the marbles once i kind of like grokked what the the math of it was behind each of these right so it's like if you take a colored marble you get to move that student that's worth three value if you have two matching marbles um, or like one marble and one white one that match the citizen, the citizens are generally worth three, right? It's either three gold or pay a certain amount of gold to get a benefit that is always valued at three more than the gold that you paid for them. Um, if you take the black marble, you get three and three, but you're locked out of doing the citizen. And so I think that's once I like realized like, oh, these part of it is like a Sophie's choice that it's like you could choose this or this and they're both worth three, but it's like which three value do you want that becomes very interesting and there was a point in this game and a stage where you you know you mentioned it even just a second ago where you took the blue marble that excluded you from from doing one of the citizens but taking that marble moved someone and triggered uh one of your artifacts that gave you three or five resources i don't even remember which but it's like hey you know that's basically the same value that the citizen's going to give you so if you don't really care what they're doing go for it right like you you can understand like which uh resource is better to you so i have i've come to really like that aspect of picking marbles and the citizens and the little the little bonuses that come with that i just want to take this moment to point out that the the most fascinating piece of the the end of this podcast is is now i'm truly starting to understand nick how you grok games you see the math in them and it's uh, <laughs> it's blowing my mind and making me feel very dumb. <laughs> or maybe vindicated for how well he does. Because, yeah, I, I certainly am not thinking about the, the math behind the evaluation of all these things. I love it. I think we just need to... I think <laughs> an episode of Nick. Nick breaks apart the math of all of these games. <laughs> I do want to say, you know, kind of despite everything I just said, kind of cooling off a little bit, And I think some of that does have to do with how often we've played it, you know, this just in the past even week is that I do think this is a game that's worth those five plays. Like, and I do think that it is, it is really satisfying and you will love discovering what you discover and uncover in the game. And I also think it's one of those games where like, if you put it on your shelf and you don't play it for a month or two, you, you are going to take it back off and 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 enjoy it all over again i don't think it's a game 
you know, we have, you know, I think I'm on my ninth play of Ark Nova. I don't even know at this point. And that game is just unfolding in a different way. I think it does lend itself to being played repeatedly back to back. I've even, I even said this about it. It just kind of like you want to just play it again and, and keep cracking that puzzle. But there's a lot more depth in terms of doing that. This is a game. Golem is 12 turns and it's trying to play those 12 turns really, really, really well. And yeah. I actually think that it might benefit from a little breathing room between plays it might actually let that variety shine a little bit it might let you kind of come back to it and see different things and so i don't want anyone to hear you know the kind of at least from my part of it saying like you know i'm cooling on it to say this isn't a great game because you know it is a great game and i have definitely enjoyed my time with it and I, you know i don't know if i want to play it again right now but i definitely do want to see where it lives in my world yeah i think that for me golem is solid but i think it stops at solid uh it depends a lot you know you said it's it's really worth your five plays and i think it depends a lot on what you're into i think the three of us are in that sort of like cult of the new we like trying the shiny things uh i think each for different reasons right for me like i really enjoy playing new stuff to kind of like see how it's working i like to you know as we were just joking a few minutes ago kind of like understand what's going on under the hood and pull those pieces out but if you're the kind of person that's like looking for a game that you're you know, like something like a Gricola that's just like a big card deck with tons of replayability and like how you do it, like X, Y, and Z this game. This isn't, I think, going to fill that that niche for you. Like this is, it's very similar, honestly, to the other sort of like a, Italian, you know, Euro game designs where it is, it is tightly wound. It is there for people who want to make strong tactical choices Um And I do think that this game falls more on the, like, tactics side over the strategy side. Like, you will pick a strategy in this game, but it's not as important as how much you're managing that strategy as you're going along. That's the bigger part of it. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm probably going to try to get a copy of this one. I think Anastasia made a great point about letting this one cool. Uh, I do think maybe hitting it so many times so recently, all in the same amount of time, is making me feel like one game is bleeding into the next. And, you know, giving it a month and then coming back, I think I would probably find more of that spark there um, but I also totally understand why other people like it seems like Nick you're slightly more cool on it than 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 maybe I am I could totally see that perspective as well but I think you know at the end of the day we've had a lot of fun it, it's, a, it's a cool game the, the rules I didn't mention it before but they take a minute <laughs> to teach there's quite a bit going on here but um, you know as far as a raw fun perspective is concerned this one has been it's been there for me awesome well I think that's gonna wrap up everything we have to say about this one we certainly had <laughs> quite a few thoughts um we haven't played a game this many times like preparing for a podcast like this i mean technically we played beyond the sun a bunch before we did that but that was all a year ago uh, this has been really interesting uh doing that because we played arc nova like twice before we filmed and this one we've all played four to five times and to a certain extent i was like my goodness did we over prepare <laughs> did we play this one uh you know maybe uh too many times i don't think that's necessarily the case but it's definitely been an interesting experiment in you know really deep diving into a game before we chat about it here and uh it's been fun yeah for sure and i'd be curious i think we'd all be curious if you know if you guys like hearing us talk about a game where we've played it a bunch versus uh i think crusaders it was a first time if you guys have any comments on that be really interesting to to check out the youtube version of this and let us know by leaving a comment on there i'd like to hear it for sure thanks everyone for listening